Welcome to Forecast IQ. As the world accelerates into the digital economy, we're going to help you stay ahead with the latest in Web3, crypto and data. This is where we look beyond just the headlines to get you the insights and knowledge that will help power smarter decisions. I'm Forecast Mekha Chada. Well, let's begin with the United Kingdom, where Prime Minister Rishi Sunak's dream of making UK a crypto hub is slowly coming to life. On Monday, UK's Financial Conduct Authority or FCA and the Bank of England or BOE, its central bank, released discussion papers for regulating stablecoins. This followed the October 30th release of a short document previewing plans for stablecoin regulation from the Treasury. The FCA's discussion paper states the first phase of crypto asset regulation will focus on fiat-backed stablecoins and the potential retail and stablecoin use cases. While the BOE paper looks at proposed regulatory framework for systemic stablecoins that are in wide enough circulation and aims to support innovation while maintaining financial stability. It also highlighted that stablecoins issued outside the UK will need to be approved for use in payment chains in the country. Based on the FCA's and BOE's timeline, implementation of the stablecoin regimes is set to take place by 2025. And talking about stablecoins, which is a type of cryptocurrency whose value is tied to another asset, typically fiat, well, there's another region that's sealed its lead in the token economy by offering regulatory clarity, and that's Europe. Crypto Assets Law, or MECA, was signed into law in May this year and will apply from December 2024 in the European Union. Now, could this law be the push Euro-backed stablecoin market needs to flourish? Focus Jenny Ortiz finds out. It was in April this year when members of the European Union or EU voted to pass what industry leaders consider to be the first comprehensive crypto regulation in the world, the Markets and Crypto Assets Law or MICA. MICA covers three types of assets, asset reference tokens, e-money tokens, and other tokens including utility tokens. But there's one digital asset that is possibly most prominent in all these rules. Stablecoin. I would say the very heart of this regulation is really the regulation on stablecoins, as we call them e-money tokens or asset reference tokens. This, this rules around stablecoins are very, very, um, I would say, concrete and strict, especially when it comes to reserves. In an opinion piece with Coindesk, Kevin Patul of Kirak wrote, besides spurring a new wave of development in the industry, Perhaps one of the most promising results of the new framework is that it will finally make a European stablecoin possible, something that has been long overdue. Eurobax stablecoin market capitalization is almost 250 million US dollars. Just a small fraction of the global stablecoin market, the top three Eurobax stablecoins are status euro. Eurocoin and Tether Euro. The European stablecoin market is not really big, especially in the context of the global stablecoin market. The reality of things is that most of the people that are interested in stablecoins are actually looking for a dollar-based stablecoin rather than euro-based stablecoin. The US dollar stablecoin dominates the market because the US dollar is the world reserve currency. So is there a need for a Eurobank stablecoin? Issuers of this digital asset believe so. Any US dollar stablecoin has to comply with American regulation. And there are no clear regulations in America in terms of how digital assets, much less stablecoins, are to be regulated. Number two, globally, um, you will see that there is a movement towards de-dollarization. Um, in order not to be, um, uh, in order for economies not to be too reliant on the U.S. dollar, and if one is to de-dollarize, then we're going to have to look at what are the other alternative currencies that can function as a reserve currency. And the euro is the second most traded global currency because it's one of the largest. Uh, economic areas in the world. However, Eurobank stablecoin makers are also aware that adoption in Europe is slow. And that's because of two factors. If we look at the, the competitors of uh, Euro, Euro Tether in, in the Europe, they are all the same level, right? They are not growing. Just because, again, from one side, you have a population, a group of populations or communities that are, they don't really need a stablecoin. 
because they have a almost perfect access to money. Maybe in the future it will change. And also the other problem is that, you know, with Nika, there is now uncertainty. And so before a huge adoption of, of a euro-based stablecoin, it might take time to clarify the pending issues with Nika. In July, the European Banking Authority said stablecoin issuers should start preparing for the new EU rules, even though they only take effect in June of next year. Now, while there's a regulatory clarity with Mika, there's still concerns of uncertainties with the new law. I think the biggest challenge is when Mika starts being adopted in June, because the European Union, unlike the, Ameri unlike the United States, isn't a political union. It's, a, it's an economic union, so adoption state by state is going to take time. Uh, states are going, to, are going to have to create a regulated, regulatory pathway to Mika licensing. And because of that, we can never be sure whether the enforcement is going to take place immediately from June or is it going to take time state by state in the European Union. But we know that it's going to be adopted. With a few months to go before the full implementation of Mika in mid-2024, Eurobank stablecoin issuers are getting ready to be fully compliant and at the same time, they are hoping the Euro stablecoin market will grow in Europe and the rest of the world. We want to make sure that uh, once the regulation is settled, it will remain for, for a long time um, so that uh, um, companies like Tether can, can evaluate and understand it properly and strategize on the long term. Jenny Ortiz, Forecast. On that note, let's take a quick break and we'll get you details on the latest licensed crypto exchange in Hong Kong on the other side. Forecast News is your gateway to all things blockchain, breaking down and breaking through the noise with the people who know it best and why it matters. We go to where the action is from Asia to the world. Forecast is the most reliable source of intellectual discourse and insight that informs, educates, and bridges the gap between the blockchain industry and the mainstream. The future is being built, and Forecast has it covered. This is Forecast News. Welcome back to Forecast IQ. A possible revival of a collapsed crypto exchange is on the horizon, and we're talking about FTX here. Multiple reports citing people familiar with the matter said Silicon Valley investment firm Proof Group is in the running to relaunch FTX. The investment firm was part of the Fahrenheit Group that made the winning bid to acquire bankrupt crypto lender Celsius assets in May. According to a Coindesk report, Perella Weinberg Partners, an investment bank which is advising the FTX estate, said the bankrupt exchange has received multiple bids for a potential restart. The list of potential buyers is now narrowed down to three. The investment bank added that the other options being considered include selling the entire exchange or bringing in a partner and a decision should be made by mid-December. Well, last week, FTX founder and former CEO Sam Bankman-Fried was convicted of seven counts of fraud and conspiracy. His sentencing hearing is set for March next year. Meanwhile, speaking to Focus, Yatsu of Animoca Brands said SBF's conviction closes a dark chapter for crypto. I think this brings final closure to a very dark chapter in our industry and also it makes it very clear that SPF ultimately was simply a fraud. And while many in our industry had already known this, people outside of the industry were the ones who had doubts. But this made it very, very clear that it was not crypto that's a problem, which it never was. It was absolutely always an issue with SPF. Uh, and also it's a signaling, I think, of a moving on in terms of, okay, we're done with this chapter because it was wrapped with all the other previous scandals. For us, you know, as an industry, I think we're cheering it on and we're really glad that uh, we can hopefully not talk too much about SPF in the future. Over in Hong Kong, the Securities and Futures Commission, or SFC, issued two circulars last week to oversee digital asset tokenization activities in the city. In the circulars, the SFC said tokenized securities are fundamentally traditional securities with a tokenization wrapper. It also said the existing legal and regulatory requirements governing the traditional securities markets continue to apply to tokenized securities. Additionally, the agency said that the intermediaries advising on tokenized securities, management of tokenized securities in the form of tokenized funds, and secondary market trading of tokenized securities on virtual asset trading platforms are also governed by existing conduct requirements for securities-related activities. Jason Chan, partner at House Williams, told Forecast the SFC move is sensible. For some, perhaps some other virtual assets, this 
uh, there might be a need for other other new laws, but for a traditional, basically an underlying traditional security with just a new wrapper, I, a new way of distribution, I think, you know, the SFC's approach is very sensible. It's, it's still regulating it from a, reg a traditional regulatory way with you know additional considerations on the on the te new technology risk the sfc also uh, is you know aware that you know there there's no there's no kind of um, industry standard as as to you know tokenization and and all these digital products therefore at the moment that the circular appears to be um, very broad and and be flexible in terms of the ways that um, you know, product issuers can issue their tokens and, and issue their tokenized securities or digital security securities. Staying with Hong Kong, where there's a new licensed crypto exchange in town. Swiss crypto bank Seba Bank announced Wednesday that its subsidiary Seba Hong Kong has received a license for crypto-related services from Hong Kong Securities and Futures Commission. The license allows Seba to conduct regulated activities in Hong Kong, including the dealing and distribution of all securities, including virtual assets related products such as over the counter derivatives. Ludovic Shum, Managing Director of Seba Hong Kong, joins us now to talk more about this. Welcome to Focus, Ludovic. Well, thank you for having me. Well, congratulations first up on the SFC approval. How does this enhance Seba's existing operations in Hong Kong? And an interesting detail of your license is that it also allows you to engage in both traditional securities and virtual assets. What synergies do you see between these two different asset classes? I think uh, this is being sort of well received by uh, by the industry. I think in Hong Kong specifically, though, um, whilst we will be focusing on professional investors, though, but. Uh, we know that uh, in terms of other market players, though, is uh, retail is also uh, open uh, is also open to retail uh, in that space, though. So uh, I think the sort of the knowledge and uh, the know-how is becoming more and more widespread. I would say in the Hong Kong, definitely. And in the Hong Kong market, what category of crypto products are the most popular? SFC recently also said that they could be open to the idea of spot Bitcoin ETFs. Do you see a demand for that? I think uh, the key word I would say in the market is tokenization uh, in terms of uh, tokenizing uh, investment products, though, be it funds or other asset class, though, bonds or that. So there's definitely a lot of uh, sort of uh, interest on that front, though. So I think that would be probably the next area of development, though, that uh, that would that would sort of take place in Hong Kong. Ludovic, thank you so much for your time. Meanwhile, we're getting closer to the holiday season and the cheer is spreading to crypto markets as well. Risk on sentiment has led to Bitcoin not only spiking to about 35,000 US dollar levels, but holding on to that mark also. And the good mood has spread to small tokens as well, prompting one research house to call it the mini altcoin season. Bring in Gregor Magadini of Amber Data on what's next for cryptocurrencies. Greg, welcome to the show. Bitcoin rose over 28% in October, you know, hitting levels that we haven't seen since August of 2022. Now, 2023 has been filled with so many events. We've had the war, we've had banking crises, inflation, etc. How do you think Bitcoin's withstood the test of time this year? I think there's a lot of things going on in the world, such as the debt super cycle and the fiat system and essentially geopolitical risks, which are essentially big inflationary events where people have governments have to spend more money on uh, military expenses when governments don't have money. So central banks will probably finance governments to do that. That that's a, a really interesting bullish backdrop for Bitcoin. The way that Bitcoin is moving in 2023, it's starting to move as a safe haven asset. So in the first quarter, we saw Bitcoin and ETH essentially move in lockstep together. And then when the SVB banking crisis happened, although the initial response was risk assets off and that included crypto, Bitcoin quickly rallied in response and then had a premium over Ethereum that it essentially held throughout the year. And we saw that premium actually get more extended during the Middle Eastern crisis. We saw a gold rally on the back of the Israel-Palestine-Gaza conflict. And then we saw a Bitcoin rally on the back of that. So in the macro sense, I actually think the, the landscape is still really bullish for Bitcoin. But what's even more bullish is sort of the industry specific stuff, which is going to be the spot Bitcoin ETF. And talking about ETFs, Bitcoin spot ETFs have been at the center of crypto developments these past few months. 
Do you expect to see positive spot ETF news coming up in the next few weeks? The way that people are positioned is that they're positioned for a positive expected uh, outcome in the ETF. But the way that I like to think about it is that Bitcoin is, unlike ETH, is clearly a commodity. And so it's actually out of the SEC jurisdiction. And so an ETF is within the SEC jurisdiction. So if the SEC actually approves the ETF, it actually gives them some sort of lever of regulatory power within a lot of AUM in the Bitcoin space or the Bitcoin holding space through the ETF. So I kind of see that the incentives for the SEC to call uh, to approve the Bitcoin ETF in order to have some sort of jurisdiction hold on it. If we get the spot ETF, we go from 35 to 40. I think that makes a lot of sense. I think a longer term target is the 50K, which is that trillion dollar mark. And Bitcoin call options are being bought between 40 to 42,000 US dollar level for December. Based on that, where do you think Bitcoin will close this year? When I look at the options market, the way that the options market is priced right now, there's a lot of implied volatility being priced in the options market for November and December and throughout the curve, January, March, so on and so forth. So right now, November implied volatility is about 45%, uh, which implies about one standard deviation daily move of about 800 bucks in Bitcoin. And even though we're consolidating right now, traders are still paying that premium because they expect some sort of continuation move on the back of some ETF news. And the way that the option market is being priced is that they expect the ETF news to come out earlier than expected and they're expecting something to happen in November. So I could see 40K uh, November price tag make a lot of sense by the end of the month. Greg, thanks so much for sharing your insights. Well, on that note, we'll take a quick break then and check in on the NFT markets when we return. Forecast News is your gateway to all things blockchain. Breaking down and breaking through the noise with the people who know it best and why it matters. The future is being built and Forecast has it covered. This is Forecast News. Thanks for staying on with Forecast IQ. Now last weekend, Yuga Labs, the name behind some of the biggest NFT collections like Bored Ape and Mutant Ape Yacht Club, held its real-world Ape Fest event in Hong Kong, but the jazzy event hit a dark spot. As some of those attending complained of severe pain in their eyes, temporary vision impairment and skin burns, this was attributed to improper lighting at the event. Yoga Labs acknowledged that some attendees suffered from these symptoms, a statement which drew plenty of flack on social media. Now, Yoga Labs also made a big announcement at the Ape Fest, so let's get in our very own Yehuda Petra to talk about it. But Yehuda, let's kick it off first with a market check and things are finally starting to look up for NFTs. If you've taken a break from NFTs, it is definitely time to be paying attention once again. A recovery is underway in the NFT market, and it began just a few weeks ago in the market's first ever October recovery. We now refer to this as October. The Forecast 500 NFT index is reflecting another seven-day stretch of green, but this recovery is much more evident in the 30-day chart. We're now seeing the value of NFTs continuing to climb, with the index firmly reclaiming levels above 1,800, now threatening to rise over 1,900. That's a level only held briefly at the beginning of October. Last week, the NFT market logged its fourth consecutive week of increasing global NFT sales, also crossed the 100 million sales volume threshold, something we've not seen in the NFT market since mid-August. Average sales prices of NFTs also continue to climb to an 18-week high of just over $70. Unique buyers and sellers both hit multi-week highs, but transactions on the other hand, still at a 2023 low. There are plenty of large individual NFT sales over the past week that are contributing to that rising average sale price. One in particular, though, stood out because it comes from a sector of NFTs that may just be a Trojan horse for NFT adoption. I'm talking about a unique 1-1 sports NFT of a budding NBA superstar. That's Victor Wembenyama. This is not your average pure collectible NFT, too. This NFT is from the now seasoned fantasy sports collection called Sorare, which now is fantasy soccer, NBA basketball, and Major League Baseball. Fantasy sports is a $27 billion industry in 2023, projected to top $89 billion by 2031. With so many sports fans around the globe taking part in fantasy sports around the year, there's maybe no better method to teach the masses the concepts and the benefits of digital ownership. Now those pesky wash sales, they've also returned to levels last seen this summer. Last week brought over $96 million in wash sales. 
This reflects traders grinding out profits, also trading their way to more blur rewards as season two of reward farming nears its end next Sunday. The blur token that traders are farming for, while it's benefited from rising prices across the crypto market, now seeing its price climb to summer levels when wash trading action was still fast and furious. The shift of traders away from SoFi platforms like Friendtech and Stars Arena is also driving some of that wash trading action at least. Personally, I think it can maintain. First, because traders finally have some liquidity, which they are happy to be spending on NFTs right now, clearly. This arrived both from an increase in Bitcoin's price and altcoin prices, but also from a major NFT project called MemeLand, giving their holders a meme coin token. Right now, that's infused millions of dollars into the NFT market, and it's going to continue to be dropped over the next two years. Traders with liquidity is exactly what's needed to power the NFT market. Right now, traders are feeling loaded up. We also have Blur and Frentech airdrops likely coming over the next few months. This may just be enough to keep the market moving for an extended period. And projects may soon get in on some much welcome financing. That's coming from traders who now are willing to mint NFTs again, but also from a new marketplace on its way later this year. That's coming from Yuga Labs and Magic Eden when they partner to launch a new Ethereum marketplace that will enforce creator royalties. That's right, while well, OpenSea last week announced that they were laying off 50% of their staff, Yuga Labs at ApeFest announced their new partnership, showing just how serious they were when they said they would work to make their NFTs no longer tradable on OpenSea. I'm not sure if any of us expected that Yuga Labs would try to take the rest of the NFT space with them, but here we are. Now, projects can potentially look forward to that steady revenue stream from royalties that once powered the NFT space and creators. Will it drive volume like we saw in 2022, though? On the topic of mass adoption, The Simpsons annual Halloween episode was focused on NFTs this week, titled Wild Bart's Can't Be Token. In the episode, Bart is turned into an NFT, and we're taken on a ride that shows an assortment of iconic NFTs from the past few years, while the show makes commentary on NFTs, and of course, pokes fun at the value of them, along with traders. Just last week, we also saw Elon Musk and Joe Rogan open an episode of the Joe Rogan Experience with a quick mention of non-fungible tokens. Their take? Elon Musk questioned the technology when most of the images aren't even stored on chain. It seems to me that they may not have had their aha moment with NFTs yet, because it's the token itself, it's the token's data, it's provenance, and the ownership record that they store that most consider the real value of NFTs. Board Ape NFT holders still would have received hundreds of thousands of dollars, some millions, worth of ApeCoin and NFT airdrops, even if their NFT had no image. The fact that the NFT is non-fungible and residing in their wallet was all that was needed to be showered in those rewards. And let's not forget the fact that projects like CryptoPunks, Avastars, and Cyberbrokers are fully on-chain. If you didn't know, Bitcoin ordinals are fully on-chain, image and all. And their community is one of the more vocal communities on all of crypto Twitter. They certainly have done their best to make sure Elon and Joe know their concerns were not warranted. Yes, exciting to see NFTs have life again, but I do think we're pretty far off from any major type of growth or mass adoption. Every day, though, it is growing closer. Back to you. Yehuda, thanks as always. Now, the crypto funding tab has been slowly drawing up. Only 300 million US dollars came in to crypto projects in October 2023, compared to $3.8 billion in the same month last year. But that's not holding back investors from expanding their shores. In the latest episode of Word on the Block, Forecasts editor in chief Angie Lau sits down with Sri Ram Krishnan, partner at renowned venture capital firm A16Z. Also, he's known as an informal advisor to Elon Musk. And he's going to be talking about the firm's move to the United Kingdom, changes at X, the platform that was formerly known as Twitter under Elon, the rise of decentralized social platforms, and the symbiotic relationship between AI and crypto. Here's a sneak peek. What potentially is much more welcoming and open kind of regulatory conversation, policy conversation that the UK specifically is having with the industry. How, how is that ecosystem, you think, going to play out in the UK? What will we see as a result of that? I mean, I think it's also notable that the UK ranked third in the world uh, in crypto transaction volumes after the US and India. So there's a, there's a lot of appetite there. We have been heartened by what we've seen from the government and what we've heard from various other policy makers, various other kind of institutions out here about wanting the UK to be one, a technology 
startup hub and more particularly a hub for Web3 uh, innovation. And you obviously seen uh, comments from various, uh, uh, the prime minister on downwards on that. And at the end of the day, the founders we want to work with just want to know what the rules of the road are and they want to get, get down to building you know, amazing platforms and technologies. Remember to catch the full episode that will be out on Monday. Well, that's a wrap on this week's show. Thanks so much for tuning in. Remember to like and subscribe to this video if you're watching us online. Or stay tuned right here on this channel if you're watching us from home. It's easy to stay connected with Forecast for the latest developments in the world of crypto and Web3. I'm Forecast Mekha Chada. Join us again this time next week as we bring you the latest from the world of Web3 and why it matters. Focus IQ, get intelligent in Web3.